Thank you for the great introduction. You heard the bad news. This talk isn't about React. It isn't even about JavaScript. It's just about CSS. But I hope that you will like it anyways. My name is Manuel Matusevic. I'm a front-end developer and I love my job. I love the fact that I get to create something that people will use. And I also hope that they will enjoy it while they're using it. I love the challenges and I also love the creativity the job demands. About 17 years ago, I made my very first website. Some friends and I played an online game and we had a so-called clan and I made the website for this clan. The name is in French and it translates to eat your poo. Uh, you can tell that we were some badass 13 year olds uh, playing that game. But the website we had was pretty great in that it had everything you need. Uh, some cool looking buttons, a guest book, I informed users that it was optimized for 1024 by 768 uh, resolution and of course it also had marquee text and some JavaScript stuff going on. So pretty great for <coughs> the 2000s. A few years later I made another website, my personal website. There is a lot of embarrassing stuff going on. I even removed some stuff because it's so bad. For example, uh, my favorite movie, The Shinning, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> But what's important about uh, this slide is that it, the site doesn't use any CSS at all. For the layout, of course, I um, created a frame set with some columns and I embedded three HTML files, files, one for the navigation, one for the main content and another one for the side bar because I needed a pick of the week where I can and a place where I can display it. The main content was, of course, a table, and there's, again, no CSS involved, just some HTML attributes like a line, background color, border color, and I set the width to 442 because 100% is just not enough for me. <laughs> okay, uh, now let's look at the overall um, layout. Still no CSS, just some HTML attributes, link, background color, A-link and V-link for active and visited links, and of course the good old font tag for font styling, size for the font size and face for the uh, font family, and another table of course, so no CSS. I didn't use CSS because it didn't exist, it was there already for some years, but I just didn't know about CSS and I didn't need it. A few years later, when I was in university, I finally learned all the great stuff CSS had. CSS had. Like floating, position, background properties, uh, line height and so on. And then, a few years later, I was introduced to the big game changer, to CSS3. All of a sudden, we had uh, box shadow, border radius, web fonts, of course, gradients, animation, transitions and all that awesome stuff and the web, the way the web looked changed significantly and it keeps changing because browsers are constantly shipping new features at a very high pace. We have stuff like filters, shapes, flexbox and grid of course, feature queries, custom properties, a lot of amazing tools and properties to create amazing experiences. But you know what Spider-Man's uncle said, with great power comes great responsibility and at the same time we also have now many tools to uh, create bad experiences. And that's exactly what I want to talk about tonight. I'm going to show you some properties in CSS that you can use to improve the accessibility of your web projects and some properties that you can misuse to change the experience for the worse. And I want to start with font size. The standard font size in paragraphs was in the last few years somewhere between 15 and 18 pixels for uh, normal text. That has changed in recent years. Font size keeps increasing. You can see that on Medium, for example, or CS Asterix, they have a minimum size of 20 pixels for their uh, paragraphs. And that's a great thing because 16 pixels is definitely not enough. Of course, it depends on the typeface, but you should probably start somewhere between 18 to 20 pixels on a smartphone and increase the font size with the size of the screen. Because, 
because usually the bigger the screen, the bigger the distance between the screen and the user. So for the usage on a smart TV, for example, you would want to have a really big font size so the text can be read from wherever the people are sitting on the couch, for example. Next, line height. The default line height is roughly at 1.2 for paragraphs and the uh, web accessibility initiative recommends something at about 1.5 for the line height in paragraphs because if the line height is higher the text is easier to read and easier to scan. Now of course this also depends on the typeface and the font size but uh, 1.5 is a good starting point and you can adjust from there. It's better for accessibility and if you compare the first one and the second one, the second one looks much nicer. Next thing, text align. By default, text is aligned to the left or to the right, depending on the writing mode or the direction. And a thing that designers like to do is to justify text because it looks cleaner if you have same length lines. The problem here is what the browser does is it increases word spacing and word spacing is bad for accessibility because if word space, uh, uh, irregular word spacing is bad for accessibility because it's harder to read if the spaces between words aren't consistent. So please don't justify text even if you think that it looks better. It's harder to read for some people. Next thing, paragraph width. Width. Here we have a paragraph, looks pretty nice, uh, great font size, line height, but something is odd. And what's odd about this paragraph is that it's just too narrow. There's only a maximum of five or six words that fit per line and that's just not enough. It's not easy to read. On the other hand, if you have too many words in one line, it's also hard to read. So what you want to achieve is a count of 45 to 75 characters per line in a paragraph. That makes text easy to read. And again, it looks nicer. You can control that with CSS. You can use the character unit for that. So you can set a maximum width of, for example, 65 characters per line. And uh, that way you can make sure that only a maximum of 65 characters will be in one line um, no matter the font size or the font family. So that's pretty nice. Next thing, pseudo elements. In CSS we have several pseudo classes and pseudo elements and some of the more popular ones are before and after. They give us the ability to add content at the very beginning in an HTML element or at the very end. Now following the separation of concerns, there's one thing you definitely should not do. You should not add text content via CSS. Text belongs in an HTML file, in a database, or a JavaScript file, yeah. in this context, um, or um, coming from an API, but it shouldn't be in CSS. No text in CSS, that's a bad thing. But what's a good thing we can use is uh, that we can use pseudo elements to add icons or glyphs or anything you like, something that's presentational. What's important here is that we know that some screen readers in some browsers will read what's written in there. So if the thing you are injecting into the um, HTML document is fully presentational and only there for design reasons, make sure to hide it from screen readers. Here's an example. I have a simple unordered list. I removed the list items and I added spans to the list items and I added this cross, whatever it is, uh, with CSS. And this is how it sounds like if you use JAWS in Chrome. I don't know if you have heard it, but it said times item one, times item two, and so on. As it turns out, this cross is not a cross, but it's the uh, icon for times, like in three times four. And that can get very confusing for screen reader users because it sounds like all the items are being multiplied, which is not the case. So what you want to do in, in such cases, you want to hide it from screen readers, and you can do that by setting the area hidden attribute, attribute to true. It's still visually visible, but it's hidden for assistive technology. 
And as a side note, in that specific um, example I showed you, it's better to use the good old list style type or list style image because screen readers will treat lists differently if the list style is set to none. So don't try to fake list items, use the um, native properties. The next thing I want to talk about is color and color contrast. Before I do that, let's get on the same page and find out why color contrast is important. There are about 285 million people who are visually impaired. That's about roughly 4% four, 4 of the population. 39 million are blind and uh, 246 million have low vision. 7 to 12 percent of all men and less than 1 percent of women have some form of color vision deficiency. Usually it's hard for them to differentiate colors like uh, red and green for example. Another reason why color contrast is important is that people like to dim their screens to save battery for example. And people use their smartphones outside even when the sun is shining. If the sun is shining on a smartphone it's very hard to use if, they, if the colors don't have a high enough contrast. But how much is high enough? The Web Accessibility Initiative defines it by enough contrast between text and its background so that it can be read by people with moderately low vision. Okay, moderately low vision, how much is that? We need a number. And there is a number, the so-called contrast ratio. And it works like that. The lowest ratio is one to one. You get that if you use the same color for text and background. So it's lowest. The highest ratio is 1 to 21 and you get it if you use black text and white background color or vice versa. The minimum ratio we should be using I for text, normal text that is less than 24 pixels is 4.5 to 1 or for bold text that is less than 19 pixels 3 to 1 or for larger text also 3 to 1. Ideally, we would have a ratio of 7 to 1 for normal text and 4.5 to 1 for bold text. Of course, there's a formula to, to calculate it, but you don't have to uh, use your calculator. There are tools, for example, Leah Verus contrast ratio, a browser tool. You enter a color for the background, a color for the text, and it will tell you the ratio. In this example, it's 13.5 to 1, so high enough or very high. Another great tool that um, you will find in the browser, in DevTools, in Chrome, is the um, redesigned audits panel. It has Lighthouse baked in and you can use it to make several checks for uh, PWAs, for performance and also for accessibility. It will check your website for best practices and give you a score. And it will tell you what's wrong with the website and show you, even show you some of the items that um, need to be looked at again. So here, those are all the items that don't have, uh, that have uh, low contrast. What's funny about it is that the help text has incredibly low contrast, so you can't even read it here. Um, yeah, so that's pretty awesome, and it's also uh, great for testing uh, PWAs, Lighthouse in, I think it's in the newest version of Chrome Canary. Or in the, yeah. Another thing that's really awesome is you can show the contrast ratio directly in the color picker in DevTools. As you can see here on this side, it, it will tell you the score and if you meet AA or AAA criteria. All you have to do is you have to enable experiments in Chrome Canary, make some settings, press Shift seven times. And that's it. <laughs> really, you really have to <laughs> press shift seven times <laughs> in order to get it working. Um, here's the explanation in a blog post by Remy Sharp. I'm going to share it with you afterwards. Now, meeting the criteria is one thing, but actually testing for uh, contrast is another thing. What we can do in Windows, for example, is we can use a system setting called high contrast and change the default theme to a very high contrasting theme, like this one, for example. And the whole theme for the operating system changes and for the browser as well. And if you do that, you will see some very, or not see, some very interesting stuff. For example, I created a login form. I, it's inspired by something I found on Dribbble. Now what's interesting about that is that it has a gray background. You don't see the gray background because the color is very low contrasting. And that's kind of the point, but should, you should actually, actually see the background, but it doesn't matter. And I used the form to test it in different themes. 
And what, what we can see here is that in high contrast themes, the button isn't recognizable anymore as a button. We see the text, we see the center text, but we don't have a background or a border or anything the like. And if it wasn't for the placeholder text, the users wouldn't see that there are input fields. A quick and easy fix was to add a default border for the input fields, a default white border, and a default, um, whatever that color is, violet border for the button. And then the forms are much better usable in high contrast modes. Another great tool is called No Coffee. You can simulate uh, blocked visual fields or color deficiencies, or you can blur the screen, for example. It's a plugin for Chrome and Firefox, I think. Definitely Chrome. Um, and you can use it to test different visual impairments, which is pretty cool. So why am I talking about color contrast? Because you can see uh, very interesting trends in the last years of using low contrasting colors, something like a gray text on light gray background. It looks nice, it looks Apple-ish, but it's bad for accessibility. So um, please try to use high contrasting colors. I, li I really like the next thing I'm going to talk about, um, because believe me or not, but people still print stuff out, and people even print websites. They print content information, directions, recipes, blog posts, they print a lot. And we should try to give them some kind of experience on paper that is, in a way, at least accessible or maybe even great. Technically, it's pretty easy. We just have to embed a media declaration in our CSS, similar to using a media query. And there we change some of our items or components um, for the special print display. For example, if we have a fixed header, we can set it to static, so it's not fixed on the paper somewhere. Um, and if there are items that we don't need, like the navigation, for example, because it's pretty useless on paper, we can hide it. You can even make something like that. You can select all direct child elements except for the main element and hide them. For example, the header and the footer, because probably you don't need that information on paper. What's also great about print is that we finally get, get to use absolute units like centimeter and millimeter because it makes sense. We know how big a paper is. And even if the user prints A3, a much bigger uh, format, we can query that using media queries. A difficult topic when it comes to print are links. They, they aren't usable on paper because you can't click them. Uh, you can try to click them, but it, it won't work. And uh, <laughs> really, believe me, uh, and you don't see where they are leading. Um, there's a nice workaround, a nice and easy selector I'm using here. Um, what it does, it selects all links that have an href attribute that starts with HTTP that includes HTTPS as well, but it doesn't include um, anchor links or relative paths. We exclude all absolute links to our website, so would you would have to change the domain here. And we use a pseudo element to add the value of the href attribute in parentheses right next to the word. So Yes, but in that <laughs> this case, um, it's great because you will see this on the screen, so the, the link, as you would expect it, and on paper you get this. So I'm able to extract the value from the href attribute and put it next to a word. That's pretty cool. If you are like me, you like to use the keyboard sometimes for nav navigating a website. For example, in a long form, because it's easier, easier to jump from one form item to the other um, by using the keyboard instead of the mouse. The thing is, it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't, because developers like to do really, really bad things to forms. It seems like developers hate radio buttons, checkboxes, selects and buttons. And I want to show you some of those bad things. Here we have two buttons, and if I click the first button, an alert pops up. If I click the second button, we see the alert as well. Now, if I try to use the tab key to focus the buttons, I can focus the first one, but I can't focus the second one. The reason for that is that the first button is an actual HTML5 button element and is focusable, and the second button is a div that looks like a button. And divs aren't focusable by default. 
Another problem here is that if you try to use the keyboard, the space key and the enter key to trigger the click event on the div, it won't work. But it works on the button because you get that for free with the button. And the button element is of course better for accessibility for screen reader users because if the screen reader gets to a button, it will announce this is a button. If it gets to a div, it will say something like div or nothing. So please use button if you need buttons. Here we have a simple page with some links and some form items with low contrast. Um, if I try to use it with the keyboard, you don't see anything. S from time to time you will see a cursor pop up in one of the input fields, but that's about it. You don't know where in the page we are currently. The reason for that are those three lines. Select all items in their focus state and remove the outline. By using three lines of CSS, you can exclude a whole group of people from being able to use your site. If I remove those lines, it will look like that. At every tab, we can see where in the page we are, because this nice looking outline will jump from, every, uh, from link to link to the uh, input fields, basically from every interactive element to uh, another interactive element. Now, the reason why developers or designers removed this outline in the first place is it's ugly. It just doesn't look nice. And another reason is that it isn't consistent across browsers. So here on Chrome, you will see this blurry blue line. On Android, you will see an orange line. And in Firefox, you will see a dotted line. So this inconsistency also is nice. So I get it why you do that, why people do that and remove it. But if you remove it, provide, provide al alternative styling. For example, you can use a solid outline or background, whatever it is, just show people where they are if they are using the keyboard. You can do that by using the focus pseudo class, or you can even use some of the newer stuff, the focus within class pseudo class. You can see here that at some point the form uh, shows a box shadow. And this only happens if one of its child items is currently being focused. So it's not about the form being focused, but one of its children. So if one of the children is in focus, the form will receive a box shadow. And that's possible with the focus within pseudo class. Uh, support is pretty good. Okay, no, it's not, it's not pretty good, it's okay. But you can use it today if you're not using it for something too critical. So if you need it, use it. One thing that's really annoying about focus styles is that sometimes you will see the blue, blue outline even when you are not using the keyboard but the mouse. That will happen especially for um, custom focusable elements like this section here. What we need is a way to differentiate between keyboard and mouse users. And that's what the focus ring pseudo class is here. It will only select those items where it makes sense that they have an outline and the browser decides if it makes sense or not. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in any browser, but there is a very lightweight um, polyfill. So who are we making this for? For you and me, the power users? Of course, why not? But also for people who actually rely on the keyboard as their only way of, naviga of navigation. Or for someone who would actually use a mouse but can't because they broke their arm, for example. Or maybe even a new parent who's holding their kid and has to check something outline. Uh, online. Uh, outline. Uh, <laughs> whatever it is, it's important for us to understand that there are permanent, temporary and situational impairments. And if we know that, that makes the um, group of people who, are, who depend on a keyboard much bigger. All right. Now let's get to some of the newer, um, more advanced stuff. Here we have a bunch of images, uh, some small images, a big version and long image, and I put them in a list and I want to display them in a grid. With CSS grid layout, that's really easy. I simply select the unordered list, I set the display to grid, I create as many columns as fit into the screen with a minimum width of 180 pixels. I create horizontal and vertical spacing and I set a default height of 180 for rows. And that's what you get with four lines of CSS. And this is fully respons responsive. 
that's pretty cool, but now uh, we lost the um, big images and the long images. No problem, I select the long images, I tell them to span two rows instead of just one. I select large images and tell them to span two rows as well. And I'm going to place the first large image at, image at the very end of the um, gallery and the second one at the very beginning. And this is what we get. Because of the different sizes of the images and the explicit placement uh, I did, we get those gaps. No problem for grid layout. We simply set grid auto flow to dense and the browser will try its best to fill those gaps. And this is what we get. Magic. Five lines of CSS, fully responsive, incredibly awesome. But it sucks because it's not usable for keyboard users. It's completely unpredictable where the focus will jump because uh, grid did its mag it magic. Whatever you do, uh, use it, use it now, but don't use it for very uh, interaction sensitive stuff, stuff. Don't use it for forms or for a gallery. And if you do, test it with the keyboard and make sure that it's still usable and that the experience doesn't suck. Of course, this doesn't just apply for uh, grid properties, basically for every property that will change the order in some way, uh, flex properties, position, floatings, or even negative margins. <laughs> While we are at the topic, who of you uses grid already? Or tried grid? Okay, two, two, two people, okay. So nobody uses it in production. Please do. Support is pretty great. All major uh, desktop and smartphone browsers support grid, except for Edge, but Edge will ship it in the next version, in Edge 16. And thanks to progressive enhancement, you can use it right now. You can provide a very basic experience for browsers that are uh, less capable and then enhance it with Flexbox or grid. To give you an example, I made a simple demo. It's a uh, very basic layout, a single column layout, it's basically what you would see on a smartphone. <coughs> yes, that's what it looks like. And here we have controls to enhance the experience. Now I'm switching to floating. And it looks nice, uh, boring, but nice. And we can enhance it some more to use Flexbox. And now, especially here in the latest article section, the layout is a little more interesting. And we can switch to grid and break out of the layout and make all um, kind of uh, cool stuff here and even make this part here a little um, more flexible. What's cool about that is that you don't have to write three or four different versions of your site. You provide a very basic experience by using float, for example, and then you just add grid because properties like float, column properties, vertical align, display table cell, inline block, don't have any effect on grid or flex items. They simply don't work. So you don't have to use feature queries to uh, reset floating, for example. It just doesn't work. So most of the time you will only need feature queries to uh, change properties like width or margin, for example. That's pretty cool. Grid is awesome. It has very nice features, but it also leads us in a new temptation. I will show you what I'm talking about. Um, let's say we want to make something like that. This very simple mm, layout with a heading and six items that are placed in a grid. I can use div and heading and unordered, un unordered list and some list items. And then I will again set the display to grid, create some columns, a fixed width column and two flexible columns some spacing and I place the heading. And it will look like that because only direct child items of a grid container are placed on the grid. So the H2 and the unordered list, but not the list items, of course. The worst thing you can do is to flatten the structure. You can remove the unordered list and transform the list items to divs. It will work, but you shouldn't compromise um, semantics for uh, design or user experience reasons. In a perfect perfect world, we would be able to use display subgrid. Display subgrid will make ch 
child items of a grid item act as if they were grid items themselves, even though they aren't direct children of the grid container. Unfortunately, subgrid didn't make it into level one of the spe specification, but it will hopefully come with level two. Another option is display contents. Display contents will make child items of an item act as if their parent doesn't exist. That's pretty cool, but only works in Fire Firefox. Now, what we have to do now is we create another grid within the grid and define columns again and the gap. This isn't ideal, but yeah, it works. In this specific case, since the un unordered list spans the whole grid, that's the first line here, one slash minus one, we can inherit all those uh, properties from the parent grid and that's um, much, much easier and nicer. So whatever you do, don't do that. Don't uh, flatten the structure. And that's it. Um, that's, of course, not everything you need to know about CSS and accessibility, but it's more than just a starting point. <coughs> if you, let's say, take two of those things I told you today and implement them in your next project and care about them, you are already doing a great job. And if you take two more things for your next project and, and care about them as well, you are working towards a better web. It's important for us as developers and designers to not just make websites for the way we use it, but to test it in different browsers, on different devices, different operating systems, with different input devices and in different settings. Because as my mentor Aaron Gustafson said, designing with constraints in mind is simply designing well. If you want to learn about accessibility, I have written some articles on Medium. Um, the first one is called Writing HTML with Accessibility in Mind. It's about HTML. And the second one is about JavaScript and accessibility. And the third one is about CSS and accessibility. It will be online next week, I hope. Thank you. Any questions? So are these slides available anywhere? Yes. Not yet, but they will be. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and how do we get it? Uh, they will be? Um, you Twitter. On Twitter? And yeah. people, okay. people tweet about it. Follow him. M. Matuso on uh, Twitter, or on the React Twitter. No questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, you have to pay for JAWS, but there are um, free alternatives. You can use VoiceOver on OS X, for example. It's in the um, in, in the operating system. Um, you can use Narrator, I think it's called, in Windows. You can use NVDA. It's a free um, screen reader. But you don't have to. Um, you don't have to get started with screen readers. Accessibility is not just about screen readers. Screen re readers are a part of accessibility, but all the stuff I just told you about is um, also a very big part of accessibility. So start with writing proper HTML, using HTML prop um, elements like section, article, headings. Try to get your headings right. Start with that. Use buttons. It sounds funny, but, but just take a look at some websites. Uh, it's uh, divs all over. And the thing with the, with the button, the div button, that's not something I came up with. Um, there, was, uh, there were some statistics on CS Asterix and a lot of people were using divs for buttons or any, anything else than uh, the button element. One of the reasons is that it comes with less default styles, so you don't have to override, override that much. You don't have to override background, border, and that's it, I think, your color. But, uh, but bootstrap, bootstrap cares about accessibility. They have some classes, baked in, and so they have best practices, definitely. Would you consider it be better to uh, override default styles to be accessible, or to um, keep default styles and like trickle down on accessibility? For example, a button, button inline. I want to span a button over a whole like page. I want to make it a block element. Should I override the default style? 
or should I stick to the what would you consider better? Is it more important to be like accessible in this case to have like your button element or should I stick to the best practices which is not override equals? Not every CSS property changes the accessibility for the worst. So uh, there are things you can do. You can change the, the color, the background and so on. But um, it gets tricky when you try to hide things. For example, if you set, um, I don't know, uh, a heading to display none, it's really not there. It's not just visually hidden, but also hidden for screen readers, for example. So those are the things you need to, to um, care about. So like I said, to answer Nick's, uh, Nick's qu uh, question, start with the basic stuff. And uh, my articles are especially about the basic things. Like just take a website and press tab several times and see if you can follow the focus styling and if you can use the website um, using just the tab key. And I promise you that's a lot of work if you haven't cared about that at all. But if you care about it before you start uh, the project, it's, it's you don't have any overhead. It doesn't cost more. So you don't need to, to um, talk to, you, to your boss and uh, tell him or her that accessibility is important and that it will cost X money. It won't, just do it. Yes? I uh, just wanted to add to all React people out there. Uh, if you're using React and using ESLint, I hope you must, must because uh, I'm doing that. There is an amazing uh, React, ESLint React plugin for accessibility that will basically guard <coughs> you from simple mistakes you can do. So like, if you do like D one click, it will say uh, to you, uh, no, uh, you, you can't assign on click to non-interaction, uh, interactional elements. Uh, and stuff like that, so uh, use ESLint and if you're using React and use this plugin. And, um, oh, I can see that. React recently added this page to the uh, docs, uh, an accessibility page. You can also check this out for some, some of the best practices, but yeah, some best, best practices. Yes? I remember in Foundation they had a time where they used a lot of the ARIA elements. Mm -hmm. Semantically correct. You can get a lot of things right by just using the right uh, HTML tags. I would even say that there are very rare cases where you have to use ARIA label described by and so on. It's especially for um, custom components, like if you're a custom tab component or a tool tip or something like that, some JavaScript heavy stuff, um, there, there it makes sense to use those attributes. But um, I would recommend to not uh, write this, that stuff by yourself because that is really hard to get it right. Um, there are, of course, libraries, for example, friend, just one example. Um, and here you have uh, accessible tabs, for example. And they get things like um, focus, right. Um, okay, I can't use it in nightly because of settings. But um, tabs are accessible, uh, accessible accordion and so on. So people already try to make accessible JavaScript components and you can use those. And there's also a great uh, project by Rodney Ram, I think his name, uh, LEJS, and there is also a lot of stuff in there that you can use.